I really appreciate having some small idea about where the things that I consume in my life come from. And so living off the grid brings that really close to home and makes it really easy to know where the energy is coming from. Well, I've been living off grid longer than anybody that I know, except for the lady next door. The house that we found that we really liked the look of the house itself was off the grid. It was understood that uh, there would be no, no grid and that, uh, that we would have to be self-reliant and figure it out for ourselves. I think for me the thing that I learned most immediately was the, um, yeah, how much each thing uses. Coming to terms with not having a toaster was a bit of a scrabble for me to begin with. Because we have a fairly limited energy budget, there's a number of typical household appliances that we don't have here. And that just means that we've adjusted our lives to work without them. Um, so that's things like a blender. Uh, a typical electrical toaster we don't have. Um, we don't have a clothes dryer. We don't use hair dryers. January 1st, 1984, we started our own small hydroelectric system. Very, very simple system. And really inexpensive equipment. And uh, since then, it has generated more than $80,000 worth of power. And with relatively little, um, little problems. Dad always had it in his mind that we had the big brook going right by there. We should harness it. One day we were down there and he said, I'm going to put a dam across here and I'm going to make a big trough, two feet high, three feet wide, and run it down through a turbine and make power. I said, you're out of your mind. <laughs> this is my sister and my mother, dad, and my brother Jim. And Snuffy. Here we are at Angus Brook Hydro. It's been here since 1997. It's pretty near 20 years. And it's been pretty well going 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We got a bunch of my friends here, and I think there were six of us, hauled all the pipe up. That green pipe is just in there where the water has gathered. Goes down the pipe, 1,800 feet, 150 feet ahead. Got 65 psi at the bottom, and it turns that reverse pump. You can call it a turbine. Uh, it produces five kilowatts of electricity. The only time we have a problem with it is when it gets minus 15 or 20 and then it'll freeze. So then you have to come up and put it in the snow. And it's not fun, you know. Everything you do up here is a lot of work. So we have our two 80 watt solar panels and our wind turbine is a 200 watt turbine. So adding that all together, we have 360 watts of, uh, of power being used. So when the energy comes in that's produced by the wind and the solar, that's regulated by the charge controllers. Then we have the inverter, which converts the DC power in our batteries into AC power that's used by common household devices that, um, that we charge, like our cell phones and our laptop computers. And the batteries, of course, is where the energy is stored. So, the, and this is our composting pilot. So the, the, the waste comes down this, down this thing here, and it falls into a big drum that is turned several times, a couple of times a week, with, uh, with this handle. Half of it should be human waste, half of it wood shavings. 
and that aids in the in the uh, decomposition. Uh, the water we have comes from uh, the brook, same brook where we get our power, and it just comes in on a, a gravity-fed line into the house. We use wood from our property to heat our home with this wood stove, and that's all we need to heat um, to heat our whole house for the for the winter. This wood stove also provides us with our hot water, with our baking, and our cooking surface, so it's really the core of the house. There's a hot water tank that's attached to the wood stove, so the hot water that comes out of our tap has been heated by this stove. New light bulbs are great. This is an LED. They're expensive. They don't use any power, hardly. If you have 10, 100 watt. 10 hundred watt light bulbs, that's a thousand watts that you're not using for other things like the refrigerator or your freezers or your vacuum cleaner or whatever. That is the Cancel Air Solar Furnace it's called. It's manufactured in Newfoundland. It's simply made out of beer cans or pop cans in such a way that the air swirls through it when the, when the fan goes on and then blows the hot air into the house. So we have a baby who's four months old and he produces a lot of dirty diapers and so to avoid running the washing machine more and more times we've, um, we've devised a little system and it's a bucket with a plunger and the plunger has some holes drilled in it and into that bucket goes the dirty diapers and a bit of soap and water, super hot water and then we close the lid and we like that and we do that a number of times through a few cycles and it gets the diapers really really clean and so that's using energy that's just from ourselves. Okay so one way that you can know how much power an appliance or anything is going to use uh, whether it's going to be a greedy appliance or not is uh, by checking quite often there's a label on the on the appliance itself on the underside it tells us its capacity this is an 1800 watt toaster well that's nearly 40 percent of your production that you put into a toaster which seems like a lot so that's why we don't use toasters at the moment. Say we're making coffee in the morning. So this electric kettle consumes about 1500 watts. And I'll get up in the morning and turn on the kettle. And if the fridge goes on, I might have to turn the lights off in the, in the kitchen because it'll be, it'll be consuming too much power. Um, but it's difficult because, like I said, you know, it'd be easy to turn on. <laughs> All from water. <laughs> we, we use the hot tub, well, sometimes twice a day, <laughs> but pretty well every day. And of course, it's still it's an, an, a necessary and integral part of our of our energy system is the hot tub. We we have to have it so that we have a dump for our extra power. If we didn't dump our extra power, the the generator would overspeed, which would mean that motors and, and other, you know, other, other stuff wouldn't, uh, wouldn't work properly. The challenges that we face living off the grid, I don't really feel as, as challenges. Sometimes slush gathers and, and, and clogs the screen. So we had to go up and clean it off. We did that twice this year. Minus six out. Tonight it's going to be minus 15. Hope the power doesn't shut off. I guess it's just getting used to the idea that things operate differently. Um, situations like um, getting our kids all ready for school and out the door and waiting for the school bus only to find out that school is cancelled because there's no power anywhere in, in, in the valley. So my hopes for the future of energy in Nova Scotia. One is that more people have the opportunity that we have to live in this kind of way. It would be good to get off the coal coal-fired uh, generating stations and oil fi we have oil-fired stations as well in, in, in Nova Scotia are among the most polluting um, industrial complexes in Canada. That there are, are alternatives to Nova Scotia power so mm. why not switch in as many ways as you can to be generating your own power. Um, we happen to be in a situation where we're totally off-grid because of where we live but you could still be in a place where you can be connected to the grid but still producing your own power as well to supplement. It opens up a, a huge industry for, uh, 
you know, an alternative industry that, uh, that could rival the oil patch. I also hope that the, the sources of energy that are going to the grid become cleaner and cleaner. And, and with all of that, I hope that that means for people like Hugo, a uh, cleaner Nova Scotia to live in in the future. person when they're young should pay more attention to that kind of stuff. What kind of a berry is that? Is it edible? Might be. Might be healthy for you. <laughs>